Settle in and enjoy this conversation with Hoffa, a Brazilian staff member for Avid for Adventure, as he talks about exploring and finding his inner child, being an activist, and what life is like in a small town in Brazil. Don't miss it. Welcome to the Avid Adventurer. I'm your host, Dave Secunda, founder of Avid for Adventure, and I am psyched you're here. Each week, just like today, I'll bring you an interview with a kiddo, young adult, or a parent as they share not only the details of their noteworthy outdoor pursuits, but also how they navigate risk, challenge, setbacks, and service in their journey. It'll bring a smile to your face and you'll feel your heart expand as you get to know the inner landscapes of these athletes. After listening, I know you'll feel uplifted and ready for your own next avid adventure. So let's dive in. All right. Welcome, Hafa. I'm so excited to have this time with you. Um, I have a big smile on my face just uh, seeing you and um, just welcoming in some shared time together to hear about some of your background and stories and where you are uh, and just share a little bit about your time in the outdoors and who you are as a person. So let me invite you to start by just introducing yourself, your name, your preferred pronouns, how old are you, where are you, uh, paint, a, paint a high level picture for folks so that they get a general idea as a starting point. All right. Thank you, Dave, for inviting me for this podcast. So my name is Hafa. I use he, him pronouns. I am Brazilian. I was born in Rio. I moved to the northeastern part of Brazil uh, eight years ago to a state called Bahia. I'm currently living at the city of Lençóis, close to a national park called Chapada Diamantina, which is Diamond Table Table Mountains. <laughs> that would be the translations. So this region was formerly uh, a region that has a lot of diamond mining, and now tourism is the main activity here, uh, which is what what I've been doing here for the past year. I'm a climber for 20 years. Uh, I have a nonprofit. Uh, I've been a musician. I've done a bunch of stuff. <laughs> awesome. Well, I, I I look forward to like exploring a number of those. I ha I looked at uh, some of the YouTube videos you shared of your music, which I loved as well. It was kind of one of those surprising, unexpected sides of you uh, that was just great to see. Uh, but let me start with a couple just general questions to go a little bit deeper. And you touched on some of those things already. But what are you proud of as far as your time in the outdoors? So this can be open-ended, anything you want to talk about. Um, for sure, I would say three things, two, two, two different things. Of, mm -hmm. uh, the collective that I have, the nonprofit here at Lensoy. So we've been providing climbing experience to underserved communities, mostly BIPOC, taking them outdoors to experience climbing, providing them opportunities to take first aid courses uh, and with international certifications, you know, um, I'm really proud of this because of, it's a way for me to provide support to the community that I'm living right now. You know, um, we are supported by uh, another nonprofit based in the U.S. called the Global Climbing Initiative, and they've been supporting climbing initiatives in all over the world. You know, so that is one thing that I'm I'm really happy to achieved in my outdoor life you know uh, again related to that second would be climbing advocacy in general you know i've been writing uh, texts and articles for different websites magazines uh, providing interviews to universities in the u.s regarding diversity jedi topics and inclusion so I was able to facilitate the first BIPOC climbing event in Brazil in 2023, where I hosted climbing clinics for a group of eight people. It was really funny. This was at Brasilia, which is DC in Brazil. Uh, others, another thing is, was just moving here to Chapada, which was a big change in my life. You know, um, I kind of felt like Coming here was embracing my true potential and living according to what I wanted to do in my life. Because my past experience, I was living in Rio in urban context, having like 
an office job, climbing during the weekends or after job, I would really just go night climbing or bouldering. So moving here, it's also something that I'm really proud of having the, not the courage, but just give, just the willingness to give it a shot at something new and, and go up to a place where I didn't know a lot of people far away from my family and close friends, you know, so it's been an amazing experience for learning and I'm so happy to be here actually. And, yeah. and at the end, this brought me to Abbott somehow. Mm. Awesome. And so talk about that just a little bit. And then I have one other question for you. Um, so Avid for Adventure, that was our connection. How did you get from Brazil to a connection with a Colorado-based uh, outdoor education and summer camp company? And, and how did that unfold? And what was that yeah. like for you? Yeah, that was, that's, that's a fun story, Dave. I, I kind of, after co- pandemic, I was looking for jobs online. And I was using like LinkedIn, not very much, not doing me too many searches. And I said, okay, let me do a random search about climbing. So I pretty much just set an alert, like climbing jobs worldwide, and then pops in Avid for Adventure Climbing Specialist role. <laughs> and, and by the time I applied, it was really close to summer season. So it wasn't possible for me to join in that year, which was summer 2022. And so... TA team instructed me to send an, e- an email by the end of the year to reapply because they were interested in hiring me for in the next season. So I pretty much set on a, an alert in my Google calendar, like 1st of October, send an email to have it. <laughs> so 1st of October, I hopped in my PC, found an email, sent an email. The email comes back, <laughs> you know, returns like something funky happening. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, gosh, I lost it, <laughs> you know. But at the end, uh, I saw the job post on LinkedIn again, and I mentioned in my application that I was hiring at the beginning of the, I was applying at the beginning of the year. And that just started happening. You know, I, I did the interview, then I, I went to US, you know, during the process I was, is this actually serious? <laughs> you know, this is actually and you had happening. never, had you been to the US before? No, it was my, my first time abroad ever. <clears throat> mm, wow. And and so when you came to Avid, what did you do? Where were you working? How was that experience overall? So uh, I was hired as a climbing specialist working at Colorado Expedition Camps. So my my position was mostly facilitating climbing experiences for campers, uh, also setting the top ropes, building anchors, introduced into the basics of climbing and doing some sc- skill progressions as well. Uh, and of course, during camp life, you have to support campers 24 seven, help them cook, camp teach them camp craft, leave no trace. So it was an experience that I learned a lot because mostly I was working as a guide professionally with adults and having the nonprofit with younger kids, but it, it's a whole different setup. Mm-hmm. So joining Avid was just an opportunity that I had to improve my skills so much and appreciate mm-hmm. that so much. And I appreciate just that on ramp as well, just to to think uh, that it allowed our paths to cross and and then deepen through some other work at Avid as well. But let me go back and just ask you another opening question. And then, boy, there's a lot of areas to dig into here. Um, if we really knew you, so if you completed the sentence, if you really knew me, you would know that. When, hmm. What comes forward for you? If people really knew me, they would know I read a lot of history and politics. Mm. <laughs> I like reading a lot. For sure, I love music. And that comes can go from searching music on the internet, reading history of music artists, or how such genre become evolved throughout history, playing music, DJing, listening, dancing. <laughs> and well, what else? Maybe this, despite the tattoo climbing style, I'm very sensitive, so I cry very easily. For example, I I cry <laughs> when I see mountains. For example, you know, mm-hmm. when I when I first yeah. saw the mountain range in Colorado flying over, I was just crying on the plane. And everybody was looking at me. What's happening with this dude? <laughs> you know, uh, but I, I I'm really emotional. So, so describe that feeling when you were flying into Colorado and you saw those <laughs> mountains for the first time. Like what what. What was the feeling and what came forward for you? It was 
a mix of feelings, a mix of anxiety because it was my first trip outdoor by myself. It was the first time I saw snow mm. in my whole life, not on TV, you know, but it wasn't far away. Then I had the opportunity to see snow closure, but you know, it was super impressive. And I was like, this is going to be so great. You know, I was super <laughs> stoked to just to walk around and explore the area. You know, I, I wasn't mm. believing that this was actually happening until the plane landed in Colorado. And I said, okay, I'm here. This is real, you know? That is great. It's also just such a wonderful reminder. Like so often <laughs> uh, people who live here, myself included, we fly into Colorado and the mountains are there <laughs> and they just fade into this experience that we've seen before. And to be kind of celebrating seeing it through new eyes through you, um, I will make sure that the next time I'm flying out, I'm trying to bring that uh, that new new vision to the to the situation there. So you've climbed for many years, you end up coming to Avid for Adventure, but back in, um, uh, in uh, you kind of in and around your home, you started this collective. Talk a little bit more about what it is, what it does, what it's doing. Um, you know, give us, paint a, paint a picture for us. Sure. So when I got here seven years ago, I saw most of the climbing scene was had a lot of people that weren't from the city, you know, mostly white cis men and affluent people, you know, and there were no local people climbing. And the climbing potential is the thing that brought me here. You know, it's huge. There's rocks everywhere. Hmm. So I was looking at this place like, okay, these people kind of lives in Hawaii. But no one's willing to teach them to surf and they don't have surfboards. So what do we do? So me and a group of friends, climbers, we decided to take some kids out for a climbing experience. They were former Boy Scouts and they, their group was over. So they had nothing to do. And one of our friends were part of that Boy Scout group facilitating the, the, the activities. And he said, well, let's take them to climb. Let's make an experience. And we did that. <clears throat> that was in 2020s and the kids just loved it. And then we started to do it more occasionally, more often, more often. And then by 2022, we decided to create a collective here to work and leave kids every week to climb outdoors. So mm -hmm. that's what we do most of the time to take them on Sundays to do sport climbing, sometimes bouldering. Uh, we instruct them, we teach them the basics of climbing. Some of them are now starting to lead climbing as well. Um, we also try to provide them opportunities of professional development. So we managed to get a scholarship on a WFA course for uh, one of the boys in the, in the project. And he passed with 18 years old. Now he's working as a guide a lot, mm. you know, so it's been really yeah, nice. That's fantastic to see that come full circle that somebody comes up through the program and then ends up guiding and helping them along the way uh, with their certifications. Um, and we'll make sure to put in the show notes a link to more information on the collective so folks can find out more. Tell us a little bit about who the kids are that are participating and um, and in general, what this kind of experience, uh, you know, you talked about that one individual who went on to be guiding more, but how overall, who are the folks and, and how has the experience landed with participants in general? So the, the, the age group is from 11 until 21. The older, the older person that we have in the group now is 21, but he, he's been since the beginning with us. <laughs> so it's pretty nice. Uh, overall, we, we have a mixed group with all range of ages. So the, those, the climbers that have more skills that will be supporting the younger climbers, you know, and we teach them skills according to their level. So let's say it's your first day, you will be taught to undo a partner check, wear your helmet, harness, tie the figure eight, and use the ADC. And then for the next two sessions, you would learn additional skills, like laying with a gree gree, you know, or lead climbing and so on, you know. Mm -hmm. But mostly we leave uh, in the morning with them, like early in the morning, we spend until half the afternoon with them outside climbing. We provide them food, snacks. We talk about leave no trace. 
Of course, mm -hmm. here the climbs are just by waterfalls, so also have some time for swimming. <laughs> so you climb a little bit, yeah. swim, chill. And it's who super, are the participants, and do you, is it free to them, or what, what does it look like? Yeah, it's only free. The participants are most youth, from, from born and raised in the city of Lensois, so most, most for underprivileged communities around the city. Um, that's so it. So just describe Lensois a little bit so people can have a little bit more of an understanding. Uh, like, if, if we were standing there and looking around, what would we see? What's, where's the terrain? People... Okay, so Lensois in downtown has a, a 18th century ar ar Portuguese architecture, colonial architecture. So all the old, all the houses, all the streets are built of rocks. Uh, there's no asphalt. Uh, some parts are is just dirt roads. It's a city that had mining, diamond mining until 1985, where the national park was created. So this was a big change in the mindset here because until then. People would see uh, nature and the environment as just a place for going to work and labor. It wasn't used for leisure, pretty much. It was just work, going up hills, hiking, and doing all that, just to get diamonds and bring it back to the city. So now we have a different scenario. The population uses this environment for recreation or for labor as tourism, working as guides mostly. So, but still, uh, we are in the middle of the northeastern part of Brazil, which is one of the poorest areas of Brazil. <clears throat> also because it can get really dry, the weather can get really dry. So we are actually in the most important rivers of the states are born here close to this national park. That's why and it's... How, how remote is it or how accessible? Like, uh, you know, if you were to go to Rio, how long does it take? <laughs> and is it easy to get in and out of? Or what does that look like? So we have an airport here, but, but flights are actually really expensive. So the easiest way, if I want to visit my family in Rio, I would need to take a bus to Salvador. So that would be seven hours by bus and then more 35 hours by bus to Rio or a flight or a two hour flight. Okay. That's super helpful. <laughs> um, and I had the experience, uh, of learning about the, the relative remoteness of, of where you are um, <laughs> when you were in the workforce accelerator over the last few months. And there was uh, a day when you didn't show up because there was a fire. Um, <laughs> talk about that a little bit and what that was like and what that means uh, and kind of why I'm even bringing it forward. Well, fire is a big deal here. Um, a lot of people, sometimes they, whenever they're preparing the fields to plantations and put fire to restart the plantation. So they burn the whole fields and they restart planting all over again. Sometimes that goes out of control, especially during dry seasons. So I was, on that particular day, I was home preparing myself for work. And then I received a WhatsApp message from a friend like, oh, looks like there's fire near your house. And I said, is that right? I don't see anything. You know, there's a lot of trees around my place. I couldn't see anything in the sky. But by the time I, I hopped into the window, I saw my neighbor coming up, all dressed up with a water pump on his back, driving a motorcycle up the, the road. And I said, okay, this is serious. <laughs> okay, I, I gathered some equipment and I went there and pretty much... Okay, and so, <laughs> Hafa, are you a firefighter? Like, like... <laughs> <laughs> what what's the story and, and you know to say more about that so yeah i am a volunteer at the fire brigade here at, most of the guides are search and rescue and wildfire brigade you know because it's something that it's a region that we don't have a lot of firefighters and structure pr provided by the state and the national park is it's very big to give an idea of the size of the region of it would be the same size of belgium or Netherlands. <laughs> the national park would be. The national park is only 7% of the region, but the region has that has the size of Belgium. The state has the same size of France. Wow. <laughs> Huge. Yeah. So, so we have to have volunteers because we're outnumbered here. So if it goes out of control, everybody, the community has to jump into the scene and support. So you, we were seeing kids old people, everybody was helping. And I have to, because it was 300 meters away from my house. Oh my gosh. And <laughs> the fire fighting equipment you were using 
pretty basic, I take it? Yeah, on that particular day, I assume I was really reckless. So I <laughs> I just ran with a machete. <laughs> I had clothes, uh, proper clothes, but pretty much what I, when I arrived in the scene, I had a machete and something to carry the, the, the leaves out of the way of the fire. And I started working there by myself because I was second in arriving in the location. Mm-hmm. Then the fire brigade arrived with more gear and equipment. Then I was, I was properly equipped, you know, mm-hmm. with all the mm-hmm. gear. And then the big team arrived and we started to face the fire. But it lasted from 8, 11 a.m. in the morning until 6 in the afternoon. We were just... Wow. And it was like... 40 degrees Celsius. Oh my gosh. So pretty warm. <laughs> it and, was quite uh, warm. And it was, and it was very close to, to where you live. Totally. 300 meters. So super close. Wow. Wow. Well, that just gave me, um, you know, more of a, of a visibility into kind of your daily life in, in describing, uh, the town and what happens if there is a fire. So I, I, I feel like more in the, uh, uh, in the understanding of what life looks like there in general, um, you know, given what you said uh, about climbing and locals in general, how did you get your start in climbing? Yeah, so I I have two versions for that. So I have mm-hmm. a more romantic version, <laughs> which is my mother used to take me to a park in Rio and there was a slab and she just used to tell me, me and my brother to go up there. <laughs> you know, later on, I discovered I was actually going up a slab that le- led to the base of a route when I started climbing. But I, but honestly, I started climbing with a friend. So uh, he took me for uh, doing some sport climbing in an area close to Rio. There's a lot of climbing in Rio, good, good climbing. And I just fell in love with it because I was doing, I was doing hikes. I was camping with my family when I was a kid. You know, hmm. I was living, I was always close to the woods when I was a kid. Every time it was like sunny, my parents used to take me out. And if it was maybe a rainy day, we used to go to maybe a museum or do something more cultural or indoors, you know. So I always loved the outdoors. And when I got older enough, you know, to climb, you know, because my mother always thought it was dangerous and there was a lot of (laughs) people scared about climbing. There was not a lot of information. It was 20 years ago in Brazil. So, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so, so when I was older, I started working and I said, okay, now I can try this. And, and I just fell in love after this first experience. And I took a course, you know, a basic course in, in Rio so I learned the basics of multi-pitching. So for the first years, I was just multi-pitching all mm. over the time. Wow, that is fantastic. It actually, I, I'm going to share with you my uh, introduction to climbing story, uh, just to <laughs> share it as well, it reminded me of it. So I grew up in Los Angeles, in urban LA, and there was really no access to rock. But I remember as a little kid, like, you know, six, seven years old, seeing some climbers on TV and thinking like, wow, that looks really cool, but still no concept of it. Um, And when I was about, um, I think, 11 years old, I had an opportunity to go to Yosemite with the YMCA. It was not for climbing. It was it was literally like a caravan trip up for camping. But I had the opportunity to come into Yosemite and see the rock walls there for the first time. And I was awestruck. And so over those few days, one morning I found my way into the climbing shop there. Uh, and I had this total aspiration, like I'm going to be a climber. And I had some money with me and I had enough to buy one oval carabiner, like one standard oval carabiner. And so like I put the money down, I got this carabiner and I'm like, I'm a climber now, you know, I got my carabiner <laughs> It's all I had. And so I ended up going back home to LA and I had this like burning inspiration in me. But um, unlike Rio, there was there was no rock around at all. And so uh, I kept thinking about kind of what I could do get it to, to to climb. And I remembered on TV, I had seen somebody repel. And so I'm like, okay, well, that's, that's where I'm going to start. So uh, I lived um, just with my mom, um, and uh, we live in an apartment. And I go into the backyard, and there was a clothesline across the backyard. 
And uh, it was like shared with all the neighbors. And I cut the clothesline down. It was like a plastic clothesline, you know, and uh, and I looped it around my shoulder like I had seen them uh, doing before. And then I climbed a tree um, that took me on top of the roof of a two-story apartment building. And the tree was about three feet from the roof. And so I got up to the tree and then I had to jump across to the roof and the roof was at an angle um, sloping downward. So this was a one-way trip. Like I jumped to the roof and that was it. I was not going to be able to jump back to the tree. And But I was like, hey, no problem. I'm good to go. I walked up to the top of the roof and there was a TV antenna. And so I tie this clothesline onto the TV antenna oh. and I toss it over the side. And then I took the carabiner and I was wearing jeans from Sears, like really cheap jeans. And I clipped the carabiner to the two belt loops in the front of the, of the jeans. And then I took the, uh, the, uh, clothesline and I wrapped it through the carabiner like 10 times. So it had some friction and I'm like, all right, I'm good to go. <laughs> and so I put some tension in the line. I was on the, on the roof. It was steeply heading towards the edge and then it was overhanging at the edge. And I started lowering myself while walking down the roof. And initially it worked pretty well, you know, while I was still on the roof. And then I got to the edge and I put my feet on the, uh, on the gutter, the rain gutter. And I looked over and it was like, you know, it was a good 30 feet down to the ground. And, um, and I, and I realized like, this was probably not a good idea. Like it all of a sudden it all hit me, but I had already started to lean back and in plastic clothesline land, those things stretch unbelievably. And so I leaned back and I tried to pull myself back up, but I couldn't. And I fell backwards over this roof, holding the rope in my hand or the clothesline with this carabiner attached to my pants. And miraculously, it held. I went down maybe uh, you know, a couple meters and then everything stopped. My pants hiked up so high. I mean, they were like literally in front of my face. It's like my face was inside of my blue jeans, but I'm like, I got this. I'm a climber, you know? And so I started to lower down and, um, and it was still going pretty well. I was amazed it was all working that the belt loops didn't pull off or anything. And, uh, and I get about, I don't know, six feet down, a couple meters. And I look around to see if my friends can see me. And as I turn my head, my hair sucks into the rope in the car carabiner and gets completely stuck. And so I am just in the mid air. Uh, I can't go up. I can't go down. It's overhanging. There's nothing to put my feet on. And I'm just slowly turning around and I can see the neighbors coming out and the other kids on the block. And then I hear the sound of fire engines because somebody's called the fire department to get me out of there. And I just, like I was so uh, embarrassed that I just like ripped this tuft of hair out and I continued rappelling to the ground and I released the system and I ran off and never to be found. It's amazing that I'm here to talk to you today after that being my first climbing experience. I assure you since then I've, I've pursued <laughs> certifications and <laughs> education. But um, yeah, I think everyone has a has an interesting origin story around uh, how they started climbing overall. Sure. But. <laughs> I, sure, I think that's the best one I ever heard, Dave. <laughs> that's very unusual. <laughs> um, Thank God you you weren't hurt in that. I mean, yeah, yeah, it was funny. Well, let me let me bring it back to you here. And so, um, you know, what having this experience working for Avid for Adventure over the summer. Um, when you returned home back to Brazil, what did you really take with you? Like, what were the feelings that you brought back and what were, uh, the learnings and the, and the, you know, how, how was that experience for you? I think the main takeaway was reconnecting to my inner child, Dave. Mm, say more about that. You know, mm -hmm. uh, because working with kids gives you that opportunity, you know, to just be silly or to have mm. fun or to mm. play around you know and mm. as adults sometimes i think we put ourselves in those box of i have to be serious and i and sometimes you don't mm -hmm. and, and that's totally okay <laughs> that is awesome 
I yeah. love that. Do you uh, do you bring that um, that lightheartedness into your life uh, more since coming back last summer? Totally, 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 Dave. Especially because I I uh, becoming an advocate and activism and reading about politics can make you like come tough because you see mm-hmm. things with different perspectives. You're reading a lot about of politics conflicts, so it can make you like oh. Yeah, this world sucks, <laughs> you know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But there are many amazing things in the world, and many different good things happening, you know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So bringing yeah. this also brings me that child uh, way of seeing life, you know, with yeah. like the desire to learn, curiosity, you know, and the willingness to enjoy the the best of life, you know. Mm. I love that. I love that. Well, um, you know, another aspect that I've gotten to know about you is your, um, well, through your participation in the Aventure Venture Jedi Committee, the um, Justice, Equity, uh, Diversity and Inclusion Committee. Tell me about your um, kind of your commitment to that work and how it showed up uh, in Brazil and your work with Avid and just give a give a moment to share with folks your thoughts down those lines. Sure. So uh, I grew, my mom is an activist, main thing. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, so I, I learned that at home. So when I was young, I was seeing my mom gathering food for bringing to orphanages as donations, you know, so I kind of grew up with that role model at home. Mm-hmm. And when I got old, I started to read about um, racism and structural racism and institutional racism and decolonialism. And then I got in contact with all that information, and I started to reflect and see things happening in climate scene as well, you know. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, I discovered a collective in the U.S. called Melanin Base Camp, which pretty much they advocate for BIPOC in the outdoor scene. So I started reading the, their texts, getting access to that sort of content. So I started to publish myself things that I was reading and thinking about this. That's when I started pretty much. At the same time, I was doing starting with the collective here as well. Those Mm -hmm. both things were happening at the same time. At the first Mm -hmm. moment, it was hard for me because let's say the climbing scene wasn't prepared for that discussion at that moment. It wasn't very Mm -hmm. open for that. As in US, you see like um, more structural action by the climbing community in terms of Jedi in general, such as Avid has something like that. Mm-hmm. So I had to face challenges of haters and stuff like that, you know, but I kept like publishing stuff and, and then I started to, I was invited to, as a speaker on a climbing event last year, um, last year, no, 2022, sorry. And to speak about racism and diversity and strategy, strategies to, to overcome um, those things in the outdoor scene. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I went there, I gave this lecture and somehow people s- started to see me as someone that's always talking about this in Brazil and climate scene. Let's say I'm the guy that talks about that in Brazil. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, I'm known by that, mm-hmm. which is fun, you know, uh, mm-hmm. but, but at the same, at the same time, it's a, it's a big responsibility that I would like love to share with more people you know, mm-hmm. to have more people mm-hmm. engage. And I'm, that's what I'm working for, you know. So mm-hmm. cause I feel like working that, and that's also the reason that I, I joined that when I saw the Jedi comedy, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because yeah. I, I saw that opportunity as a place to learn and to exchange information and maybe I can bring this back to Brazil or how can I uh, extend the debate here in Brazil? How can I learn? In, inside Jedi comedy and Avid and bring that and transfer that to my collective or to my community or to whatever, you know. Well, and now you've um, you've transitioned from field staff and, and again, you'll be working with us again in the field this summer uh, with expeditions, but in the rest of the year, you're a full-time uh, worker on the talent acquisition team uh, overall. So, how does that uh, kind of inform your day-to-day work, especially in that realm of hiring and, and kind of being in that, uh, uh, in that role in the organization? I think it totally relates to the work, especially because I'm doing mostly international hirings. So mm-hmm. 
I have to, to talk to people with different countries, different cultures, with different possibilities and opportunities in life. So, and mm -hmm. so we have to make sure during the process that that process is inclusive for everyone. I think that's my main concern always overall, that people should be feel included and should see that effort by Avid. And I, I feel like we do a pretty amazing job, honestly, on that, you know, to help people to to supporting them with travel expenses, sponsoring visas, trying to find housing opportunities, you know. So uh, that relates a lot to my job, you know, to the way I interview candidates, you know. I had to I have to share this experience with you, Dave. Uh, this week I, I was interviewing uh, a black woman and I, and. I cried after. I said I was crying, baby. <laughs> but, mm -hmm. but not, not this week, but a couple of weeks ago. And when I was asking her, you know, have you ever had the chance to practice our core sports? And he said, well, there's no such thing where in the country where I live in the region. And, and that hit me so hard. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. kind of was like, people still need way to go to have access to basic things. And they need even more to have access to the outdoors, you know. And I think we're doing an amazing job bringing international people, creating opportunities for those people to join the outdoors, to pursue an outdoor career. You know, I myself, I never mountain biked before going to Abbott, you know. So I had a great time mountain biking. I biked in the urban context, but having the opportunity to learn that new skill and something that, of course, we have the financial barriers such as climbing and the outdoor in general, uh, providing this opportunity for people, for me, it's very fulfillment, you know, gives me a, a feeling of fulfillment, you know. Mm, I love that. Thank you for sharing that story and beyond. Um, you know, I do get the sense just talking with you. I mean, you, you talked about kind of rediscovering your inner child. And I, I see in you this childlike wonder. I, I see it in your smile and your uh, your curiosity. Um, and I wonder also just how that playfulness has shown up in your climbing. Like how, how do you approach climbing as a sport primarily personally? Um, I, if I recall, you mostly are a boulderer, uh, but talk about kind of your feelings about climbing and what that, why, why that is something that you do. Yeah, that's, I think that's the hardest question to answer in this interview, mm -hmm. but I mean, what I'm, when I'm look for a climb, I mean, I just, I see climbing as a, as art. So it's, it's a choreography on the rock for me. It's like dancing. You know, so for me, it's, it has, it has a lot to do with a static sense when I look at the futures on the rocks and I imagine the movement and how, how it's going to happen. You know, that's what, dri what drives me the most now. Uh, I've been mostly bouldering for the past years. I love a lot of sport climbing. I've done tons of motor pitching when I started climbing. I've been a competition athlete as well. But for now, I'm more, I, I, I'm just driven to explore. So normally I go out with my pad and okay, I like that rock over there. Let's go there. <laughs> you know, that's mm. what I like to do. <laughs> you know, wow. no, not, it's not about the grades itself. For me, it's mostly about the fun. I, of course, I like to climb hard and to challenge myself, but that's not my main goal at this mm -hmm. point. You know, it used to be mm -hmm. when I was younger, but now I'm good. <laughs> Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I love that. Describe for me the feeling inside of your body when you're climbing. Like, what is the what is the sensation? You know, what does it what does it actually feel like for you? Oh, it's moving meditation. You know, it's mm -hmm. like moving I clear meditation. my thoughts and I'm mm -hmm. just there. I can hear my breathing. You know, I'm mo I'm focused one hundred percent in what's happening. You know. For me, it's like the best experience overall. I try to meditate different ways, but actually climbing for me, it's, it's the best way I can get so focused and dialed, you know. And at the same time, when I have to do a power move, you, you can just leave, let that energy go out. And that's also really good. I really enjoy mm -hmm. climbing sometimes hard because of that as well. It's hmm. great. Wow. Um, what else haven't we talked about that you think are areas that uh, you'd like to share with folks? Well, let's see. 
talked about the collective, if I talked about coming here. I don't know, uh, Dave. I, what would you f did you did you feel like before having this interview with me? Though you had a lot of information that I said here, or there are a lot of new stuff coming out <laughs> that you ha didn't have any idea. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, there's it's a mix of the two, uh, but I would say, as I'm guessing um, from folks who are listening to this as well, that for me, it's a little bit of a selfish experience having a conversation with you. I've always enjoyed talking with you. I always find. Uh, I always find learning and upliftment through our through our conversations um, in in a few different ways. I mean, one is just as you said, this childlike wonder comes through. Like you exude this energy of of curiosity and fun in a beautiful way. Um, and then I do tend to learn about Brazil every time I talk to you and um, get more of a sense of where you are and the relative remoteness of that. And the level of responsibility that that uh, that that brings with it, um, and so you know, for me, I I again selfishly just enjoy learning more about you and what you bring to the table, and am so happy to you know be able to call you a friend, but also be able to have you in the circle of Avid for Adventure uh, to bring who you are to all the people that you work with and all of the the youth that you interact with as well. So. Um, you know, down those lines, it's always, always really a pleasure to to talk on any, any topic with you as well. Um, and I do feel like it's, it's different having folks working out of the country for us. And it's a constant uh, reminder that um, of the, I'd say for me, of my privilege and the general, the privilege uh, and resources that we have available that I take for granted, things like the internet, is going to work and things like I'm not going to go out and have to fight the fire that, you know, is coming up next to my house. Um, and so it's, it's a great reminder, um, overall. And, uh, even just that the privilege of travel is something that I've realized a lot talking with you. Um, just, you know, when you shared, it was the first time for you traveling out of country, the first time going to Colorado, and then just the incredible impact uh, that that has had on you. Um, and sometimes I forget the privilege that I have to be able to, and have had the experience of traveling, um, and the, the benefits that that brings. So, um, you know, for me, it's just like this heart opening, eye opening opportunity to kind of dig a little bit deeper. Yeah. Yeah. I totally, I totally feel they, uh, uh, I haven't this talks with you and all the time we've had content, we ha always have amazing and conversations and opportunities to be vulnerable you know and that's what i i like the most about talking to you you know because mm -hmm. i can just be myself and mm -hmm. that's something i really appreciated in avid you know it was a, a place that i i could be myself as a professional because let's picture half a, let's picture me 12 years ago you wouldn't see this hair you wouldn't see this beard you would see me wearing a suit shaving every day you know, wow. and probably not yeah. with this smile, you know, because <laughs> I was sitting mm -hmm. on a, on an office doing meetings, going time from not happy with what I wanted to do in this life, you mm -hmm. know? So I think something that was game changer for me was actually saying, I'm not going to spend my whole life waiting for the right moment to live my dreams. I'm going to, mm -hmm. I want to live it now, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. How do you bring that environment to other people? How do you create an environment that allows people to show up as all of who they are and feel comfortable with that? Oh, Dave, I try to encourage people to just be authentic, you know, mm -hmm. because uh, I don't know. I, I myself in the past, I, I doubted myself. I was like seeing myself on imposter syndrome, you know, and oh, maybe I shouldn't be talking about this, advocating. Maybe I shouldn't put in my space too much. Or why are you doing this? Do people actually need this? All those questions that come through your mind. But whenever I see someone with those struggles, I just tell them to, yeah, do it. 
do whatever you want. You know, as long as you're not creating, creating any damage to yourself or the others, do it. If you want to do it, do it. Just be authentic. You know, I like to empower people overall, you know. So if you tell me, okay, how far I'm going to try to go down my my house rappel and use like wires or whatever I said, okay, try, just try to do the proper way this time. <laughs> you know? Heard. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Hafa, I've so enjoyed the time together on this. Uh, again, I'll make sure to put in the show notes ways that people can uh, reach out to you, um, via either social media or the collective or everything in between and find out more. Uh, but thank you for sharing a little bit uh, about yourself and your journey. Yeah, thanks a lot for the, the invitation, Dave. I just en enjoyed to, a lot talking to you. Yeah, and everybody, whoever they, whoever wants to know more about me and the collective, just follow the links, follow this podcast. Yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity today. Awesome. Have a great one. Yeah, you too. I hope you enjoyed hearing from this avid adventurer as much as I did. Join me every week as we continue to explore the inner landscapes and outer accomplishments of our guests. And if you know someone who you think would make a great interview, please reach out to me at the email in the show notes. I look forward to reconnecting next week.